Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, here for episode 56 already as we approach the midsummer point here where we've had some pretty good warm weather for most of the North American continent and lots of Europe as well. Hopefully you're enjoying some summer holidays and some vacations and I've got a little bit of news to share with you today. So let me get right into it. Just want to continue on with a segment I did on the last show for the Canadian EV market sales. Just quickly, I got some revised numbers after that show aired that actually carried sales into the end of July. So the market share is up from 2% to 3% for plug-in vehicles and sales of EVs have increased 30% year over year by numbers. No numbers were given. Uh, and this is a direct correlation to the increase being um, attributed a lot to the financial incentive that the Canadian federal government has rolled out that started May 1st. So these numbers go from May, June and July for those three months. Canada's target for zero emissions to achieve a zero emission vehicle sales is 10% by 2025. So we're at 3% now with about five and a half years to go. 30% by 2030 and 100% by 2040. Pretty ambitious goals. Um, I've had this conversation with a lot of YouTubers uh, comments in the last week or so about timing. And when, uh, you know, we talk about tipping points, we talk about EV sales and so forth. Um, I, I would follow the government's projections here fairly, probably fairly accurately. A lot of people are seeing that this tipping point into EVs are going to come within the next three to five, three to seven years, let's say. I think it's it's a lot longer. I think it's it's a couple of decades. And I'll segue into that right now since I'm on the topic. And I'll, I won't talk too long about it, but the reason I, I again go back to thinking it is we are a, a nice culture for many reasons and for histor history and so forth. And even if prices on EVs continue to come down, which they will, and there, we will hit cost parity at some point, that will be a shorter time frame. I think five to seven years. Some people are predicting a couple, some people are predicting a bit more. But that's kind of my take on cost parity. And um, I believe that cost parity will happen way before a tipping point in EV versus ICV sales happens. But when I say tipping point, I mean 50% of yearly global sales are EVs or more. Right now we're at 3% globally a year, right? So we have a, a, we have a long way to go and it doesn't necessarily double, triple, like it's not 3% this year, doubles to 6%, doubles to 12, doubles to 24. So in, if you do the math, it would take you four or five years if you're at a doubling effect, but that's not how we are in a hockey stick. There's no doubt about it, but we're not in a doubling effect. And I don't think that's sustained for uh, that short, that period of time. I think, you know, we will see a slowdown, but it's still going to be a positive net increase. It just won't be a doubling effect. So my prediction is that we will get to a tipping point, I would think within the next decade or probably two decades. I'd like to see it sooner, but I still think it's a ways out. You know, the 2030, when you're seeing about these targets and, and countries banning the sale of ice cars, new ice cars by 2030, by 2040, that's going to help stimulate and increase the adoption. There's no there's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, for Canada's a target to be 100% by 2040, I think is realistic in, in the way the time scale works and the way that this business works. So I won't spend any more time because I could talk for hours on this. I had some great simulating conversations over the YouTube comments with some people. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much for sending those in. That was really good to have that conversation. And it's good to have different viewpoints. And it's something that, again, I, you know, I'm not saying it has to be my way or the highway. It's that's my opinion and which my opinion will change over time as circumstances to the marketplace change. So I'll keep checking back. But the bottom line is good to see Canada. Uh, still uh, increasing EV sales, even with the provincial incentive that we had here in Ontario going away last year, which, which really drastically slowed down our sales. The rest of the country seems to be picking up the slack. Now here's a quick story about Proterra. And if you know Proterra, you know that they do a lot in the EV bus segment. They're like BYD and some others. They're out there doing quite well in fulfilling uh, transit uh, type situations, converting fleets into all electric buses. Well, they've come out with an, a smart move, similar to Tesla, similar to VW, similar to others that are offering a lot of their technologies to OEMs or other equipment manufacturers, as they call it, or other manufacturers in general, um, that want to look at electrifying other types of 
uh, heavier type of uh, vehicles, uh, not necessarily cars, but trucks and, and all kinds of different elements there and buses. So Proterra's uh, come out with something called Proterra Powered, and it is a combination of vehicle electrification hardware, init their initial design and consulting, some engineering services and integration, uh, supporting all that with service training and charging infrastructure implementation. So what that means is that if, if I was a, a company that builds dump trucks, as an example, and I wanted to get into the electrification of those dump trucks and, and get away from diesel as an EV newbie, I'd be able to jumpstart that project by, by using Proterra, uh, Proterra's battery systems, their powertrains and charging solutions, because it would come in as a complete package. It would save me a lot of effort and time and re-engineering and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think that that's a pretty excellent idea to help fuel uh, non-consumer based electrification so commercial based electrification and you know a good proof point of that is when Proterra partnered with um, Thomas uh, built buses uh, which is a company that builds it now is now building electric school buses on the Proterra the based on the per, uh, powered Proterra package or Proterra powered so many acronyms so many names so you know that is a great example of taking diesel school buses today and, and converting them relatively easily on the assembly line into an electrified, fully electrified chassis, and they make per great use cases because they're generally shorter haul ranges with a couple of trips a day with time to charge and, and all this kind of stuff. And even in the worst weather, they can be relatively uh, great, you know, instant heat, all kinds of benefits there. So uh, keep your eye on Proterra. Um, I think they're, they're, we're going to start seeing more of these OEM relationships because that's where. The marketplace needs to go in order to really spur EV adoption, especially on the cons commercial side. Um, but even on consumer, you know, with VW, you're offering the MEV platform to anybody who wants it to build a vehicle with that. So these types of relationships, I think, are key to continuing uh, EV adoption and growth. I talked about the Renault uh, E208 on a previous shows ago because I saw it at first fully charged live, had a chance to poke and prod and climb around. Nice vehicle. A uh, little tight in the in the in the rear seat for my liking. It's a little small, but great compact car. Well, they've uh, launched um, the pricing for that. The base price for the electrified version, which uh, they only come in a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, size is 20, just over 25,000 pounds, and then you can go up to about 29,000 and change, just under 30,000 pounds, depending on the trim level that you get, uh, be it active, Allure. GT line or GT. The GT, the top spec one, is comes only in a, uh, an EV variant. It does not offer a petrol engine choice. Um, so again, it's good to see that 25k starting point. You know, for EVs, I think that's going to get a lot of people involved. And it's a, the E208 is a nice car. If people like that version and the petrol version, I think they'll like the electrified one even better with all the advantages that EV driving gives you. So keep your eye on the E208. If any of my viewers have a reservation in, I'd love to hear uh, what the timelines they're telling you because uh, I'm understanding that they're going to start deliveries uh, in the UK at the start of 2020 and early 2020, but maybe things can shift or change. If they do, please let me know. Love to hear from you. Now, here's a pretty cool car that I stumbled upon in an article. Um, and, you know, I don't talk a lot about what's going on in Russia, but I'm glad to see that there are electrification, move, the, the revolution, so to speak, has hit there. I don't want to cause any political issues here. So, I'll, 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 you know, EV revolution, let me be specific. Uh, but Russia has been working on a very small commuter type vehicle for quite some time. Um, loosely based on, on an Indian uh, model ve vehicle, the Bahindra E20, if you're familiar with that. But uh, it's called the Azeta City Module, uh, and uh, Module 1, or CM1 for short. And uh, the key that's stuck in this article is that it will have a projected price of $7,000. Now, you can convert into the currency that you would need to which I think is pretty cool. It's, the, it's been developed for quite, for, in, uh, for quite some time. They've been actually flaunting a prototype uh, since 2017. So there is a couple of years under the belt here of this thing. Now, it's not a huge vehicle, as you can see by the pictures and video that's rolling, but you know, um, a little bit, just a tad bigger, 34 centimeters. Uh, you can convert that to inches longer than the Smart 4.2. So that'll give you a, a size element. 
Um, you know, it's got it's a three, just over three meters long and just uh, one point six meters wide. Again, you can convert that to uh, your your system. Power in this case is a little unique because they're going to be placing uh, in, uh, induction electric motors in each wheel, so you can get two four wheel drive, two or four wheel drive out of this, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and they'll have the electric electric controllers and the uh, computers to control all that ABS uh, traction control and all that stuff that comes with that. Now it's not going to be a super powerhouse. They're talking about a nominal 46 horsepower or 34.4 kilowatt of nominal power and up to 97 horsepower or 72.4 kilowatts of maximum power. I I don't have specific other. Um, power measurements other than a loosely given 30 newton meters per kilogram of torque um, rating and I don't do I have a weight here I don't have a weight so I can't tell you what that would equate to uh, but you know again EVs give you that instant torque and they don't have to be don't have to have a ton of batteries to actually get going at a pretty good clip I don't think this is going to drag race any Model 3s anytime soon but it'll be a nice vehicle to get you around town now um, Zeta has developed their own battery management system for this and they promise a range of around 124 miles 200 kilometers when you're running it in eco mode and that's very very good range for what looks like to be an urban runabout in the big city of Moscow or some of the other ones uh, that are in Russia now these uh, they plan to show the car in November, probably either through a launch or, or at, a, at a car show and start actually production this December. Uh, I don't have any details of where they're going to produce be produced. I would guess either China, India or, or Russia. Those are my three picks of where it'll, it'll come out. And if anybody has any more information, they can add it to the comments uh, on YouTube. Uh, but again, you know, it, I mean, it, it's I talk about mass market. I talk about price points. This is something that's going to appeal to a lot of people. It does say it'll hold four people. I think you need to be really skinny to get in the back seat, uh, but or a couple of kids. But hey, for for an urban runabout for seven thousand bucks U.S. Uh, and your operating costs are next to nothing. Uh, I don't know what power, how much power is in, in Russia as far as their delivery mechanism and how stable the grid is. I'm assuming it's pretty decent. So I think that uh, this is going to do well. And again, it's great to see, you know, getting a, instead of getting into another, uh, you know, a Fiat or a Lada or something that you would normally get for that kind of situation, you can get into a fully electrified vehicle and cut down on emissions. And that's what it's all about. Now, speaking of cutting down on emissions, the Port of Auckland, New Zealand, has been kicking around their strategy for doing away with emissions by a certain time frame. And they, one of the uh, options that they're looking at is replacing the tugboat fleet that operates that, that within that port. Well, they've signed a deal with a Dutch company called Damon Shipyards, and they're developed a full-size 70-ton bullet pull, that's a rating, uh, electric, fully electric tug. Uh, the first such unit called the Damon RSD-E Tug 2513. It's a long name. It'll be delivered to the ports of Auckland in 2021. Ah, you thought I was going to say 2020, didn't you? 2021. Um, it'll be able to do three to four operations uh, in a day, uh, usually, and usually they take about three to four hours, and then recharge over a period of two hours. So, so not necessarily daily, but they'll be able to do three to four operations within that span three, of three to four hours, to recharge for two hours, and then go back and do some more operations, which I think when you look at the, the way tugs operate and their scheduling seems to fit within the business model. But uh, again, another application where um, this can make a profound impact because there's a lot of ports using a lot of tugboats. And if uh, I'm sure some eyeballs are on this and if, if this tends to fly fairly well, which I think it will, we may see a bunch of others. So good luck to them. And last article today is, it's actually snippets from an article that I read, uh, read a review that somebody posted about the Kia Nero EV doing a long road trip. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about their thoughts about the Kia itself and the car and how it handled everything. Cause I've done my own review and there's tons of other material on there, but a couple of points I wanted to focus on this is about the road tripping aspect in a vehicle. That's not a Tesla because we hear a lot about Tesla, their supercharging network, you know, their their mantra was, if we build it, they will come. Let's build an infrastructure and then sell cars to support so that inf that infra infrastructure can support those vehicles because we know people are going to want to want to just, you know, interchange this car with the car they have today and be able to take long trips. And that's a very smart model and it's worked well. All the other manufacturers, of course, are catching up to that model. They, they 
pretty well most of them don't build their own charging infrastructure. Some of them have very small pockets or, or their collab efforts with other organizations. Um, so that infrastructure is catching up. So we've got cars, but we don't have enough infrastructure. But this good article about road tripping, I mean, we understand it's not currently easy, that easy today, uh, especially if you don't have a Tesla vehicle. And even Tesla doesn't have superchargers everywhere. So you still have to watch. There are some voids, but, you know, it is getting better. And this, this um, our, um, commenter here, the writer uh, articulates that in conjunction with ChargePoint, EVgo and other minor players, you know, this, this conglomeration of EV charging networks that we're seeing happen. And I talk a lot about, you know, more, more growth in that area. Long distance travel to non-Tesla is a reality, but you you still have to be cognizant of some things to do with that. Um, I, now, this viewer, uh, this uh, uh, author here, this article, he did a trip of about a thousand miles and gave all his feedback on how great the, the Kia was. Uh, and it was a fantastic car. And I think the, the element to zoom in on this is that his experience was that it took about 30 kilowatt hours of power to go about 100 miles plus or minus you know that's a good baseline to judge efficiency range all that kind of stuff at least at least in a ev that's a 60 kilo that's in that 60 kilowatt hour or higher club something along those lines okay your miles is going to vary if you've got a model s you know 100 <laughs> versus a bolt right it's good they're going to be different but just use that as a baseline that 30 kilowatt to go 100 miles or 30 kilowatt hours to go 160 kilometers if i convert that all right and, and that's based on a variety of conditions and speeds in today's ev so even though you may look at you know get up in the morning and your your rain your gom says oh i got 390 kilometers of range you know in my uh kona ev or, or kia nero or whatever um, but once you get on the highway, you start driving, weather, traction, all kinds of different wind, load, passengers, everything, right? Everything has an effect on EV range, no matter how small. So take that as a summary. Um, and if you look at that, um, the Kia Nero, by the way, does actually slightly better than that average. That was his real world experience with it. But what that, that formula means or that average means is that for long distance travel, it's possible as long as there's a reliable source for charging every 175 to 200 miles or so for this type of vehicle, for that 60 kilowatt or higher vehicle, 60 kilowatt hour or higher club vehicle that I talk about. In this range of class, you know, 200 some odd miles, 60 kilowatt ish hour pack range, that's a pretty decent formula to look at. So, if you can route, route out a, a map out a route of about 175 200 miles for to find charging points, that will satisfy your trip of a thousand miles. Let's say you were planning. If the bigger the battery you have, then obviously less planning is required because you can go that extra more discount uh, distance and look at less number of stops. But yes, certainly I get asked this question a few times. Can I take a long trip in my electric car? Can I take a long trip in, in my electric car? Absolutely you can. You just have to plan it a little bit differently than you would your ICE vehicle. All right, and that's it for this episode, episode 56 of the EV Revolution show. I had to remember what number it was. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. As always, uh, enjoy the YouTube comments. Uh, would love you to like and subscribe to the show. Don't forget, I, I always forget to mention, ring that bell thing. Uh, you, you'll get notified automatically when new shows are posted. I think, I think pretty well we all get an email when there's a new show out if you're subscribing. But uh, the bell will help you out with that. Um, so thank you very much for continuing with comments. I do enjoy them. Some we get some good comments, some good thoughtful discussions going there, and I appreciate that. Um, again, uh, you know, uh, my Patreon supporters, uh, God bless you. I appreciate that. I'm always humbled um, by by Patreon, and uh, you know, get a get a couple more here and there as time goes. If you are interested in supporting me via Patreon. You can certainly do that. Just go to the website and uh, check out how you can do that. Um, I also received an email from a viewer who wanted to give me a one-time PayPal donation, which he did. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm assuming it's a he, but that person. I, I much appreciated. You know who you are because you watch the show and you're regularly uh, on the on the comment section. Thank you very much. I'm very, very humbled by that experience as well. I appreciate it. If you'd like to do that, send me an email, reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is 
coming up at the end of the show and uh, you can and I'll send you the details on how you can do that if you choose uh, but you know again and don't forget about my Twitter and that kind of stuff so please follow me on Twitter if you haven't so on that note thank you very much for watching the show I appreciate it uh, and until the next show I hope everybody please stay safe uh, have a great the rest of the, uh, the summer I mean I'll be back probably in a, in a week to do another show but again until the next time I'll see you when I see you all right take care bye bye